Welcome everybody to the class today on cultural appropriation and its negative impact on North American indigenous peoples. So today we are going to be unpacking appropriation and you will be joining in an open discussion from a diverse group of indigenous designers, artists and educators regarding the impact and problematic effects of cultural appropriation in fashion. We will be discussing historical contexts, unpacking appropriation, how we are demanding change and taking control of our representation in today's media. So I just want to briefly introduce myself. So hashlahel tuol gualapu gualapu daishud deseyayaya Karina Emrick Zietstadt talal chad koyalap. Uh, hello to everyone. Good day. Welcome to all of my relatives. I already have seen some of you up in the chat. So what is good? I am Karina Emmerich. I am um, Puyallup. And on my father's side, I am a white settler on my mother's side. I am originally from the Coast Salish territories, um, but I am here now on the occupied territories of the Canarsie tribe in what is now known as Brooklyn, New York. My pronouns are she, her. So I am a clothing designer, artist, activist. I have a small slow fashion clothing line based out of the occupied Canarsie territories. Um, I also serve on the board of directors for the Slow Factory Foundation. So thank you so much to the Slow Factory today for hosting us um, and for getting this conversation started. Um, I'm really excited to be here today with an incredible group of people. So I want to first start by defining what cultural appropriation is. First Nations author and writer Lenore Keishing Tobias says cultural appropriation is taking from a culture that is not one's own intellectual property, cultural expressions and artifacts, history and ways of knowledge. But I also wanted to add in this specific descriptor from one of our guests today, Adrian Keene. There is an inherent power imbalance. It is the dominant group taking from a marginalized group. With cultural appropriation, this also often plays out in the realities of colonization. It is the colonizer taking from the colonized. I want to just give you guys a little bit of a historical context. But when I sat down to really think about what to write for the introduction to this class, I found that I kept pushing it back and pushing it back. I am kind of a procrastinator, but I started to feel like I wasn't able to set an intention for this topic. And as Indigenous people, it's really important for us to set an intention for why we're here, why we're speaking, and why we're teaching. But I realize that my hesitations around this topic lie in generations of hurt and anger. Because when we begin unpacking the concept of cultural appropriation, we also have to start unpacking histories of assimilation, genocide, exploitation. And it is not simply the concept of taking an idea that's not yours. What we need to start with is that everything was taken away from us. As Adrian said, it is the colonizer taking from the colonized. Along with many indigenous people, I am a descendant of Indian boarding school and residential school survivors. The residential schools throughout so-called North America had two main objectives, to remove and isolate children from their homes, their families, their traditions, their languages, their land, and to assimilate us into a white, civilized culture. Everything was stripped away from us. The phrase coined during this time was kill the Indian, save the man, which is indicative to the violence and abuse that took place within these schools. The implementation of residential schools, along with forced removals and relocations of indigenous people from their homelands, among a myriad of other atrocities like mass murder, were straight up genocidal tactics. Along with those direct tactics, most traditional indigenous gatherings ceremonies were not just looked down upon, but they were outlawed as a policy of assimilation. So if you're thinking to yourself, well, Karina, this is like the 1800s and we've come such a long way. I just want to remind you that the so-called United States, indigenous people were not legally allowed to practice any sort of religious freedom until 1978. 
that was the year my older sister was born. So the point I'm trying to make in this introduction is that we cannot talk about appropriation without also discussing assimilation. Because what was violently stripped from our hands, outlawed and almost lost, does not now make a cute sweater. In fact, the Indian Arts and Crafts Act that prohibits misrepresentation and marketing of American Indian or Alaska Native arts and crafts products within the United States was not implemented until 1990, which was five years after I was born. I know that this is not a history class, but historical context is imperative to this conversation. And I urge you all to do some more in-depth homework on the topics that I have brought up. So let's all take a deep breath and settle back into 2020. We are here today to break the idea that indigenous people only exist in a historical context because our communities are revitalizing and thriving. We are not mythical creatures who hang out with unicorns. We are your neighbors, friends, classmates, and teachers. There are over 560 federally recognized nations, but the more realistic number of unique tribes is around 700s. And I wish that we could have two representatives from each tribe here today, because we are an extremely diverse group of people with different histories, songs, stories, art, clothing, etc. And we are not a monolith as we are often represented in the media. So with that said, I want to introduce our guests today. So we have Dr. Adrian Keen, who is a writer, activist, and founder of the Native Appropriations blog, which we will send you a list of websites. Um, incredible, incredible writer, author, thinker, speaker. We also have Christian Allaire, who is a fashion and style writer at Vogue and is likely the first staff writer at Vogue that is indigenous. We have Jamie Okuma, who is one of my idols. Um, fashion designer and incredible artist. Um, her work is absolutely phenomenal. And we also have Tanya Larson, who is just beautiful, one of my, who I'm blessed to be able to call one of my friends, um, whose beautiful land-based design work is absolutely stunning. And we will get more into each person's work. Hi, welcome everybody. So um, I wanted to share just a quick visuals of like the work that you do, but I also think it's really important that you each individually introduce yourselves in your own words. Um, so uh, I'll just start with who I see up here. Christian, if you would like to start. Hello everyone, my name is Christian Allaire. Um, I'm Ojibwe, I'm from Nipsing First Nation, which is in Canada, Ontario. And I am a fashion and style writer at Vogue. I've been here for full time for about a year, freelancing for them for about three years, if you like. And yeah, I've sort of made indigenous fashion my beat there, sort of unexpectedly. I, I never thought to do this, but it's something that is sort of ingrained in me. So, and saw a need for it there. No one was covering this. So um, yeah, I've been focusing on that a lot. Not just that, I do all sorts of fashion, but it's obviously my passion to do Indigenous fashion. Yeah, my name is Jamie Okuma. I am Shoshone Bannock Masenyo Wailaki, and I am coming to you from the La Jolla Indian Reservation, and I just really like to make stuff all the time. That's me. <laughs> Chujri, Tanya, Oji, um, Franz Gwashen, Ishli. Um, my name is Tanya Larson. I am um, I was born and raised in France, but I uh, now reside in the Northwest Territories in Yellowknife. Um, my mother uh, was Shirley Firth. Uh, she was Gwich'in, and my dad is Jan Larsen, who is Swedish, and that's my background. And uh, I'm a full-time artist here in um, Benin Day, and I do a lot of work on the land and also um, jewelry. So. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Adrian Keen. I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. I'm originally from Southern California in Encinitas, which is Kumeyaay homelands. And I now live and work in Providence, Rhode Island, um, which is Narragansett homelands with Wampanoag homelands and other communities nearby. I am a faculty member at Brown University where I teach classes in Indigenous studies, but I also am the author of the Native Appropriations blog that I've been writing for 
over a decade <laughs> at this point, um, cataloging issues of cultural appropriation. And uh, yeah, oh, and I have a podcast now too called All My Relations. So I would like to just jump right in. The burning question on so many people's minds when we talk about appropriation is how do you answer the question of appropriation versus appreciation? And feel free to just jump in and speak whenever you want. I want this conversation to be pretty organic. It's like appropriation is when you steal something. So you see something that you love so much, you take it and you say, this is mine now. And you replicate it without any context, without giving due credits and also profiting um, off of it. And for me, I kind of see it like you see someone, you kick them down, and then you steal the food out of their kid's mouth. That's how I see it. For me, it's weird because like appreciation is kind of always a form of appropriation. And I know that sounds weird, but like, you know, you hear designers talk about their inspiration for the season and what inspired them, what, what, why they appreciated this certain culture. It, it always is kind of appropriation. But I think when, when it really is wrongful appropriation is when you're drawing from a culture that is, has been wronged, has, you know, is not, you're not involving them. It's, it's, a, it's a weird line, but I think ultimately like you can appreciate something and you can draw from it and that's just part of fashion but appropriation is when you're you're drawing from a community that's struggling as it is and you you know you know what I mean like I don't know and not involving artists who need to be involved and who have the right perspectives on things because indigenous culture is so not one thing it's it, you need to know the specifics of what you're drawing from and that's when it goes very wrong is when, and that's when it's appropriation is when you don't do that. Yeah, totally. Uh, Adrian, do you have? Um, sure. I, so in my presentations, I often quote from this random tweet that I found in 2015 that I think is really useful um, by a user that's at J the nerd kid. Um, and the title of it just says how to respectfully participate in um, someone else's culture. And the three points are one, be invited uh, two, follow your host's lead and three, respect their boundaries. And so to me, that seems like a pretty like simple, straightforward, like if you would like to appreciate and respectfully participate in a culture that's not yours, like one, be invited. <laughs> that seems pretty obvious, but is not in the world of appropriation. That invitation is what's lost is that it's a taking without permission. Um, and then follow your host lead is, of course, being respectful to the community that you are wishing to appreciate, letting them um, demonstrate what is okay and what is not okay. Um, and then respecting boundaries. So when people say this is okay for you as a non-native to wear or use, but this is for us, this is sacred, this is not something you should um, be participating in or using, respecting that boundary. So um, to me, that's kind of the, the line that I draw in terms of the appreciation versus appropriation. And then it also goes back to the whole like honoring conversation, I think, too, when people are saying that like mascots or Halloween costumes or Columbus statues or something are honoring indigenous people. But the way that um, I feel honored and respected is if people are allowing me to represent myself, allowing me to be in power, allowing me to have control over the representation um, that's respect, that's honor, that's appreciation, not just like deciding willy nilly how um, you would like to use our aspects of our cultural practices. Yeah, I find it really interesting. And I, and I, the, the concept of honoring, I think that's hammered in a lot when people are saying, but, but we're honoring you, but we're honoring you. And it's kind of like, it's difficult to say uh, that you can honor somebody without also listening to them. And I think that so many indigenous designers speak out against appropriation that um, I wonder now if that conversation is even still legitimate or if people are just inherently participating in their erasure of indigenous people by continuing to appropriate our culture. And I think a lot of what we 
talk about with appreciation is that if you want to actively appreciate indigenous cultures, that means supporting indigenous people around you, supporting indigenous designers. Um, and it's not about stealing. Um, so we can get into we can get into that a little bit more. But I do want to ask a more specific question that is it possible for non-native designers to be inspired by traditional indigenous artwork? And if the answer is yes, what does that look like? Because we have a history of being burned by the concept of consultations in the past. So does it look like a resolution of shared profits? Does it look like bringing indigenous designers on board? Or is it just simply a hard no and to leave indigenous design to indigenous designers? I mean, that's a question I get a lot is, you know, can any old designer, if they want to be inspired, how do they do it? What's the right way? I think there's no way around it. You need to collaborate with someone. That's like the first step is not just a consultation. It needs to be at least a 50-50 collaboration with whoever. It could be, if you're inspired by Navajo prints, you need to find a Navajo textile designer like something of that nature. And it's not just collaborating with them on the designs, it's, it's giving them half the profits. You're taking so much from this person and you're getting their expertise, you're getting the context. And if you're inspired by that, that's great, but you cannot just have a 15 minute Zoom with them and then call it a day. Like it needs to be way more involved in that. And you know, it's, it's something not a lot of designers are willing to do. I mean, because it is, you know, it is a real commitment to collaborate on something, especially a whole collection. Um, but that's just, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very specific thing to draw from. And like I said, to do it right, you, you need to involve them in more than just a consultation, I think. Yeah, agreed. I think, I think it's interesting that I'm we talk about this idea of collaboration, right? So, so many, so many designers work with other designers. Tanya and I have worked together before um, to, on in Santa Fe Indian Market presentation and and shared our work together. But so often our work is just stolen without also being a collaborative thing. And I think that goes back into the idea that like we we aren't here anymore. That like we only exist in this historical context. So Jamie, I actually want to go to you as somebody who is extremely prominent and celebrated within Indigenous art and fashion. How is your work received by both Indigenous communities and the high fashion community? Within the high fashion, I don't know. You'd have to ask them. I don't know anybody directly to, to see or uh, hear what they think. I've been around a long time. I mean, I'm I would say fairly young still, but I was a baby when I started in all of this. So I've heard it all from everybody. Good, bad, now is different. And I know, I know we're on a panel talking about appropriation, but it's gone like way out of control, I feel, to where I get daily emails asking, can I buy your stuff? Can I wear it? Is it okay? Am I going to get attacked? And because that we're so... Gosh, I hate saying it, but it, there's a there's a line, and I I'm to more where when it's outright theft, which has happened to me, where it's copyright infringement and intellectual um, property stolen. When you talk about appropriation, there's so many designs, um, especially like universally within native country geometrics. You can see that all over the world that doesn't belong to us, doesn't belong to anybody. And, and some people have gotten like super sensitive thinking that's just a native design. Well, rugs in Afghanistan and Pakistan look like that, you know? So um, I, I'm more focused on actual theft of design, which really, really sucks. And there's no recourse. With what happened to me, I had, I had spoken with three different attorneys and they said, well, if you end up with anything, it's just going to pay us. So it's like, <laughs> but social media took care of that. So that's good enough for me. <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's what, thank you for saying that. Cause that's one thing that I definitely want to talk about today. Um, 
is like with the advent of social media, do you think that in a way that it's even the playing field when we're talking about cultural appropriation? Because now, now people not only have access to indigenous designers and we have access to marketing, right? Which, which is like something that can be extremely costly if you're an emerging designer, but also that social media can be used for us to combat cultural appropriation and share that knowledge. So, like, do you guys have opinions on social media and how that has boosted your own work? For me personally, I feel like it's been everything for a long time before Christian came along. We're our own voices and social media proved that. Like, I, I can't even believe how, how well my fashion has gone and people can judge for themselves if they like it or not. And just simply because of that I have this amazing fashion career and that's because we have our own voices we can choose to like things and and buy things that we see from our own people that we like I said before Christian (laughs) wasn't getting any notice in the in the outside world so yeah it's I mean there is there's definitely there's very bad on social but I think overall the goodness outweighs that yeah, and for me, I think it was it's super important, especially for um, artists and designers that are in smaller communities, that are on smaller reservations, that are in like the Arctic. This is our way of being able to like share our stories. And even though we are far from like centers and stuff like that, we get to share our culture. We get to share like what's important to us and completely different point of view that than like mainstream. And I think that's what's super interesting and also it allows you to create a community of support I mean like we met through Instagram (laughs) Karina and I was like we wouldn't be friends today if it weren't for it and that was like that's where a lot of collaborations and such uh, stems from and also for the for the topic of cultural appropriation this is where um, there has been like a big stop sign because now people who have historically stolen from our cultures don't get to do it without repercussions. Like we get mad on social media. Like if you want to have, like if you have anger at one day, you just like check out, you know, Boho Chic or Native Inspired or stuff like that <laughs> for like someone was asking for a clear example of cultural appropriation. Just put that in the taglines for Instagram and you will see so many things. And then when I started, I didn't have that much followers. And I was like, what do I do from Yellow Knife here? And then I would tag, you know, Adrian. I would tag Diet Prada. I would like post it on my story and get a herds of people in the comments. And that's how we deal. We have our community come in and be like, this shit has to stop. It is not okay anymore. And this has become a way of holding people accountable. And I think that's why social media has been so powerful because they can no longer silence us and talk about us as relics from the past. We're here, we're alive today, and we're going to come after you if you steal from us. Yeah. Um, as someone who like 10 years and in internet years is like centuries. <laughs> so I sometimes feel like I've seen this like arc of change around these conversations where 10 years ago, like I had my little black and white blog spot, like blogger website um, that was literally me as like a sad grad student being like, people are stealing. It's awful. <laughs> and um, to see now like the communities that we have built online like through Instagram through things like Beyond Buckskin Boutique that really like paved the way for a lot of this and the fact that like I have yet to be able to get a piece of Tanya's work because it sells out in like five minutes (laughs) because it's like posted on Instagram and like Jamie's entire collection sold out in 15 minutes and it was just through social media. So the tools that we are able to harness and like have a voice in this arena where previously uh, Native people were just so shut out, um, it's like gets me a little emotional thinking about like just the big change that we've seen in the last decade. 
Um, cause I like with my little blog was able to like tweet or email like Paul Frank. And we had like a whole thing that came out of that. Um, or <laughs> when I got mad at Netflix, I can send a tweet and then there's like actual change to things, um, from that where like, who am I? I'm just one person like sitting in my office, angry behind a keyboard, but, um, b- through social media, we can like shift conversations Um, folks weren't really even talking about appropriation 10 years ago outside of academic circles. Like that idea, the term cultural appropriation was like a anthropological thing. It wasn't really something we talked about as a community. So having shared language around being able to talk about these things, having a shared kind of like, um, Tony was saying like a set of, um, steps to follow through of like you identify something you're able to like follow these certain steps and um, ultimately affect change so yeah there's a lot of um challenges with social media i recently had to leave twitter because of it um so there is some backlash and hard things too but i think overall the net positive and the community that's been built um has been huge for native communities that are so spread out that are so diverse that are rural and are urban and have all of these different challenges to be able to have this tool is incredible. I just want to give a shout out to Adrian because when I was in college, I this is when I started getting interested in this stuff, okay? Like I, I knew I wanted to write about indigenous fashion because no one was writing about it, first of all. But, um, the you know, I would watch these runway shows and see these like I mean, in the early 2010s, like people were putting the headdresses on the runway, like it's, it was a lot worse than it is now, but the only person calling these people out was Adrian. I will say that on record. She is the only site that would like regularly do this. And it's crazy to see now how much that's grown and even mainstream publications are thinking about that. But 10 years ago, they weren't. And it was because of Adrian. So just putting that out there. Oh, thank you. I was building on a legacy of a lot of other amazing people too. Um, especially in Tumblr, like the world of Tumblr, that was like my inspiration. So those folks were really what I built off of. But I do want to, um, what Jamie brought up too, in terms of like the the backlash now, or like the kind of, I like actually feel some level of, <laughs> guilt for like the level of focus we had to put on appropriation as a concept because no one knew about it no one had language to talk about it and so for you know like 10 years it's been like appropriation 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 but it's not a perfect concept it's not a perfect term it came from like white anthropology it's not something that came from our communities it doesn't embrace like indigenous ways of knowing because we only have in like this world that is currently known as the United States that is based in capitalism. We have ideas of like trademark and copyright and like concepts that don't work when you're talking about indigenous protocol of like, if you in an indigenous community want to use something from somebody else, there's a protocol you follow of asking permission for that, of gaining permission, of giving um, recognition of where the thing came from whenever, like if you were taught a song, you talk about who gave you that song, who gave you the permission to sing that song, all of those things. And um, that is not captured in the term cultural appropriation. So when people are like frantically worried, like, can I wear Jamie's things? Like, can I wear Tanya's things? Um, It's because the term is not quite capturing really the depth of what we're talking about here. And like, to be clear, yes, you can wear Jamie's things. (laughs) Yes, you can wear Tanya's things. Yes, you can wear everyone. And Jamie often says, like, we wouldn't be making it if you couldn't wear it. Um, So I think there's a need to, now that we've established this conversation for 10 years, uh, there's a need to now move to the next step of, like, okay, what are we really talking about? How do we, like, terse this out and make it more nuanced and more applicable to the current system of power structures in Indian country, the way that we work in, through indigenous protocols, all of these kind of things. So that's my little rant about taking ownership for the fact that I like helped proliferate this idea and now we need to like <laughs> rein it back in a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting to think that like a lot of people are 
bring up this idea of like, why are we still a fighting appropriation when there's so many other things that we need to worry about? But the fact is that we're still at this step in representation. We're still fighting for our own representation. And it starts to become difficult to move forward when we're still fighting, we're still fighting for our own representation. But I wanted to ask you, Adrian. so in like in the decade long that you have been working on the Native Appropriations blog, have you now started to see a shift in appreciation for Indigenous art and designers in order for us to now move forward? And do you think that the Black Lives Matter movement and the anti-racism movements have had an effect on our own representation? I've absolutely seen a shift. And I think like what we were just talking about is part of it. And I think the biggest thing that is so exciting to me is that I don't have to be the one to have the, the only one to have these conversations anymore. Um, like there was a small group of us and now it, everyone can, is perfectly capable of having these conversations on their own, which is really exciting. And I think the accessibility of being able to buy directly from indigenous designers and artists also has changed um, the whole thing because before you had to like go to a powwow or like a, a museum or a, like store on um, a reservation or something like to, in order to buy directly from native designers. And now with the internet, um, you're able to buy directly. So that has really shifted the conversation um, as well. And absolutely Black Lives Matter and um, the movements around racial justice have contributed to the momentum. Um, and like, if we think of things like the Washington football team, that was decades long of hard work and lawsuits and activism and all kinds of things that got us right to the precipice of like, this needs to change. But it was the movement of Black Lives Matter and all of the uprisings around the country that really got us over the edge. So like we as a community, as a native community have so much to uh, gratitude for um, what other communities have been doing around these issues. So. I think there's a broader awareness now around issues of race and racism in um, in fashion um, overall, and that Native folks, because our numbers are so small, we often get invisibilized, but we can build off the momentum of these other communities as well. And that's an a important line that we have to dance between of like demanding for our own representation in these broader racial justice movements and recognizing that we really are benefiting from the work of other communities as well. So I think that solidarity is really, really key in moving forward um, and that we definitely um, are seeing a bigger focus on indigenous issues thanks to the broader movements. Yeah, I completely agree. and. Christian, I want to now go to you as somebody who is now representing Indigenous people in fashion. You've taken on that role. And I think like all of us here are so appreciative of the work that you do and the role that you've stepped into. So can you talk to us a little bit now about how you are integrating Indigenous voices into a larger platform that is Vogue magazine? Well, it's changed a lot since I first started doing it. I think at the beginning, it, it was it was so new to everyone, you know, it was just not being covered. And so I had to do stories in a way that was introductory um, because, you know, the Vogue audience isn't familiar with the ins and outs of Indigenous culture at all. Um, so, you know, the beginning stories are really just introducing even the concept of what Indigenous fashion is you know, just going over the basics. What's it about? It stands for sustainability a lot of the time. It's rooted in tradition, like just the things we know, but a lot of people don't know. Um, but as it's grown and we've realized that people are actually really interested in this, I've been able to get a little more, not abstract with it, but I don't have to be so generalized anymore. Like I can really just focus on one brand and focus on what they're doing why they're unique. Like I, I find myself, yes, having to still explain things a lot and explore the history, but I, I find that I can just, now I'm, I'm able to actually just explore things that are really interesting to me and that 
people doing really cool things who might not even be following tradition or who, are, who might be on the other side of the spectrum. Um, and it's been cool to see that develop, like not having to dumb things down. I, I hate saying that, but in a way you often have to for out such a large audience. And now I feel like people want to know the more of the specifics. Um, and that's great. That means that people are like learning and at least know the basics now and stuff like that. So it's been cool to see grow. Yeah. So Jamie, I was, I was actually listening to on all my relations podcasts. I was listening to the interview that Adrian and Matika did with you. Um, and you had said that when you originally started and you wanted to become a designer, you wanted to separate your indigeneity out of your design. And that really resonated with me as a young person. I was like, I want to be a designer and I don't want to be an indigenous designer. I just want to be like Alexander McQueen. So yeah. now, <laughs> which is like, well, I'm not a white British man. Uh, <laughs> right. um, you but how, how, <laughs> how do you now, because your traditional work that's been passed down, your artistry that's been passed down is so, so ingrained in the work that you do and present now. So can you talk to us a little bit about that and whether or not you think that indigenous design should be considered haute couture? or if you think that Indigenous handmade craft deserves, it, deserves its own titles? Well, just for understanding purposes, for like how Christian was talking about, the people just don't know outside of our community. So um, yeah, just for understanding, of course, it's haute couture. I mean, it's all done by hand. And unlike a lot of um, major fashion houses where you've got the designer, and you have a team doing it for you. No, my hands have beaded everything that you've seen. Um, what was the beginning of your question? I told him, oh, the podcast. Yeah, um, when I was younger, I think it was more of just a rebellion thing. It was like, you know, I was told I was gonna be an artist. Everybody knew it when I was a kid. I was the artsy one in class, you know? And so I was like, yeah, I don't wanna do that. I don't wanna. I'm not going to do that. And then it became to, well, why do I have to be just the Indian designer, the native designer? I want to be like every, but then thinking that I have this and any, any one of us designers, we have this thing that everybody wants. That's why you see it on runways every fall. Um, so why not embrace that? Nobody else can do that other than if you're native um, doing our own designs. And so, yeah, I take pride in that, that I am a native designer, native artist, and I can be in with everybody. I don't need to be like everybody, but we can share the same playing field. And thanks to social media, we can. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I'm so grateful for your work. But I also want to talk to you, Tanya, about similar similar things, because a lot of the work that you do is really, really rooted in tradition. So do you feel like that there's a strong sense of reclamation in the work that you do? And can you talk a little bit about your design practices and how, how they're land-based design practices? Yeah, for sure. Um, for me, it was about reclaiming my culture. And um, I moved, like I grew up in France, um, but my mom always told me I was Gwich'in. And I moved to Canada when I was 15 because I wanted to get to know my culture better, uh, to get to know my family and my land on that side. And um, it was hard, it was, it's not easy. It's, it's not because you're, you're born indigenous that you have all the knowledge and um like i didn't even know that my mother attended residential school i didn't even know that the last school that closed in canada was in 1996 i was all angry saying that fact i didn't realize it was in my community like in the town i live in in my mo mother sounds those are where you know the schools were last opened and it took me years to actually find places where I could learn how to tan hides because it was really hard to be able to find people. And for me, it was super important to create work 
like specifically jewelry because it was something that you know is smaller it's like small sculpture so small pieces of work that did not require so much material and that also is super personal and um, intimate because it's you wear it on your body like and it's so close to like your face your heart like heart and everything and um it's also like cultural indic in indicators you know so you get to show up and people are like what is that and then you get to talk about your culture you do you maybe get to talk about like oh this designer and talk about what nation they're from where they're from so they're really like conversation openers but they're also like objects of strength and it's about re like it's a perfect like witnessing object of that revitalization of our cultures and it's for me it was very important to be able to do that and um, a lot of other people are reclaiming different practices whether it's um, you know tattooing um, medicine, gathering, you know, medicine on the land, creating clothing, like creating footwear. And there's so many different things that is happening now because our ancestors were so strong and resilient in um, surviving what happened to them and were today celebrating everything that was so work, that was worked, like that was done to make them ashamed of who they are and where they're from. And so I think that's why it's so important. Yeah, it's interesting. And I wanna get into the conversation of reclamation because a lot of our cultures and histories were stripped from us. So just to get into the nitty gritty of it, and I see that there's a question already in the Q and A's, but because indigeneity across Turtle Island, which is what is known as, you know, uh, North America, we call often call Turtle Island, that our people are so diverse that many people have adopted pan-Indigenous cultural indicators. And this can lead to Indigenous on Indigenous appropriation. So let's, let's start unpacking that a little bit because this is something that uh, Christian and Tanya and I have been talking about as something that's um, been coming up in my head a lot. But I really want to unpack this in like a really honest way. Um, and I want to talk about how obviously this also relates to um, the process of assimilation. Well, I mean, <laughs> okay, I don't have all the answers. <laughs> I'm just going to say that first. I, but it is something I'm asked a lot, even from my colleagues, is like, can one tribe appropriate another tribe? Is that a thing? And to answer that question, I don't know. I think if if someone wants to acknowledge another tribe's design and fashion or something. I don't see it being an issue if you're indigenous, if that's just me, but I still think you do have to do the work still and still educate yourself about what it means, what's the context. I don't know if you necessarily have to collaborate with someone. I mean, that obviously is great. It's, it's such a murky area, like I really don't know, but all I can say is I think you do need to do the work as much as a non-Indigenous person and recognizing the history of what you want to maybe like experiment with, I think. But tell me if you guys disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah. that it is possible um, I because what has happened so far is really saying Native American culture, but Gwich'in culture is different than, you know, Shoshone Bani culture, different than Cherokee culture. We have like extremely strong histories. We have extremely strong designs. And the more you study it, you're like, holy moly. Like we do have similar elements. Like uh, I think what was so impressive when doing research is the trade routes across North America. We had humongous trade routes. like. Dentalium shells came from the Northwest coast, was traded all the way up to the Arctic. That's why you can find those elements both in Jamie and my work, because we were organized societies and we had major commerce routes, you know, from South America all the way up to North America and the Arctic. And so 
that's the beauty of knowing the history because we're no longer, there's no longer that image of like, you know, Native American running in the forest in a lone cloth. Like that was not us. We had societies, we had irrigation, we had agriculture, we had commerce. And it really kills that image that we needed to save the natives. That's why it was okay to murder millions of them to take their land. And so I think it is very possible today to still appropriate, you know, different cultures, but there is such a thirst for people that have been displaced, for people that have take, been taken away from their families because, you know, of adoptions to like white families, for example, or from residential school or just being, you know, all those kind of things. And people are so thirsty to have an element of culture that they resort to pan-Indigenism. And that was me in the beginning. Like, I remember my favorite dress was like, billabong dress with like native print and I didn't know better but now that you like spend that time learning your own culture then you know more and that's the same for cultural appropriation it's like you know that all of our cultures are super rich and it's important to study your own before taking from someone else yeah or understanding others before you get accused of stuff and yes it is possible to do that, but also prior to um, this call out thing we have going on now, when I was younger, I did a lot of other tribes um, as far in my artwork. But back in the, I mean, those I had very special connections with, that is nobody's business, but mine and theirs, and they understood that. And so that's why you, see a different tribe's influence in my earlier work. Nowadays, you can't do that, like, at all. It doesn't matter what it is. People ain't going to hear it. So with my work now, it's all, yeah, it's my tribes. So, um, yeah, and, and Indian people know that inherently we have these connections. Like Tanya said, my, I have this beautiful photograph of my great-grandfather. He's got woodland moccasins, a Lakota war shirt, and, you know, I don't know probably trade, but he was wearing that as a Shoshone Bannock man. So it, that's part of our history is trading, um, sharing designs. And so we just, it's this, this call out culture. You really need to know what you're talking about before you go after people. Thank you, Jamie, for that. Um, I, yeah, I think <laughs> we were, we've had, we were having extensive conversations about this recently. Um, but I think this again points to the limitations of like the term cultural appropriation because it's not the same thing <laughs> if we're talking about like intertribal relationships. So to me, I think about like, racism is a structure that inherently involves power. So that's why you can have Native folks who are anti-Black, but you are not having Native folks who are racist because racism requires this system of power behind it. And I tend to think of cultural appropriation in the same way in that it is a system of power. It's not just this like exchange that's on any sort of even playing field. And so that's why it gets complicated when we start throwing the label of appropriation on uh, intercultural exchange. So with that said, I do think it's possible for communities or for artists to take things from other communities in a way that is not positive or productive or uh, respectful. Um, and I see, like, I will call out my own <laughs> tribal members all the time of Cherokee folks be rocking stuff that is not from our community <laughs> or not anything like that. Um, but so there are ways that I see it done nefariously in stuff that is not appropriate. But then there are, are beautiful exchanges that can happen as well that um, Tanya and, and Jamie were talking about. And part of it that worries me is that so long we've been fighting the stereotype that our cultures are static and are like set in the historic past and like there was some pure version of our culture that was like in the 1800s and everything from that has been like a dilution of that like tradition or like that realness 
But the the real the reality is that we have always been adapting to new technologies, to new trades, to new communities um, coming into contact. We've been learning from one another. We've been sharing cultural practices. Like there's no way our communities would have survived for thousands of years without that exchange from one another. So I really want artists and designers to be able, if they want to, to dive really deeply into their own culture and find all of these elements that have been uh, suppressed for so many years and pull them out. And I'm loving what like young Cherokee designers are doing lately, like finding kind of this Mississippian um, roots of our culture to be able to pull into things. Um, But I also think that there's space for us to talk more about that history of exchange and that um, experience that we have always had of culture adapting and changing and growing. So that's where the appropriation conversation doesn't work for this piece of it. Um, And to draw attention again to what Jamie said, that's when we're hinting at the backlash of social media we as Native folks have had to be on guard and be really aggressive in going after big companies and big corporations who are using our images and our designs and everything for profit. But that aggression towards the like outsider has been turned inwardly. And we are now aggressively going after one another oftentimes in these situations. And that is not a positive way of having this conversation. So I think there's a lot there to unpack, but part of it is the limitation of this I, this term, this idea of appropriation in that case. But it goes back to the like being respectful of your relationships. And if you are in relationship with another a person from another community, if you have that like reciprocal exchange, then that's going to show through in your work versus like someone who's like, oh, I think Navajo silver work is cool. I'm Cherokee, but I'm going to make it and yeah, so I think there's like those pieces to it as well. Yeah, thank you all. I mean, the one thing that I really want to hammer home during this conversation is that the concept of cultural appropriation needs to be an ongoing conversation. So we could really sit here and talk about this for like a year because there's so many things that we need to cover within this conversation and it not only goes into fashion. I mean, we're right now we're in October, which is a particularly difficult and emotionally exhausting month for indigenous people because we're approaching um, Columbus Day. Many people are still not willing to abolish Columbus Day and replace with indigenous people's day, which is the reality that we're facing here in uh, New York and Lenape Hoking. So that's really frustrating. And then also we're coming into uh, Halloween months, which is just a a massive cross-cultural appropriation. As somebody who, who used to be a bartender, working on Halloween was always really, really, really difficult. Um, but I don't want to get too far into the Halloween conversation because that's like a whole nother thing. So I really, really want to focus right now because we're going to go into Q&A. But I want to ask the last question that I have for you guys as we continue to look forward because that is the goal of this conversation. So where do you see the future of indigenous fashion and indigenous representation in fashion? Well, I am very excited (laughs) about the future of indigenous fashion. Um, I mean, I I haven't been doing this for ages. I've I've been working for like five years. So that's not a long time by any means. But even within that small timeframe, the the way I've seen it change is insane. you know, this year alone, like seeing indigenous models on the cover of like Vogue Italia, five years, that would have never happened. It wouldn't have. And there was two, I think, last month on the cover. Um, So that's great to see. I think we're finally seeing strides changing in the modeling industry, which has been one of the worst for representation for indigenous people. You know, Black models, that's been an issue, but indigenous models, there's been zero, like zero on the runways, especially. Um, So that's great to see. And even just with designers, like the things I'm seeing is, it's like, it continues to blow my mind. You know, now we're seeing like the rise of indigenous streetwear brands, like Mobilize is one of my favorites, but there's so many OXDX, Section 35, like there's so many. Is that what you're wearing, Jamie? Oh, look, we got a little yeah. moment. 
There's so many streetwear brands, which is so cool, you know, speaking to the moment, but still respecting your traditions and acknowledging your tribe through something like a hoodie. Like that's just so cool to see. And, you know, we're seeing like swimwear brands and we're just, we're really seeing it branch out now to a bunch of categories that are really unexpected, but still done in a really thoughtful way. So I'm really excited to see where we're going to go even into the next five years. Like who knows what we're going to be seeing in the years to come. So I'm just really excited. I'm saying I'm excited. I think um, more and more people are finding uh, the strength to be able to like do this full time. And so there's so many more diverse um, artists and designers that are coming up. And um, I'm like, I can't wait for the day that I'm going to be dressed like in indigenous designers from head to toe. And Today it's possible. Five years ago, it was already hard to do that, but today it's possible to do that. And um, to know that you're not just supporting a huge uh, conglomerate, but you're actually supporting communities. You're bringing money in communities and that money makes a huge difference. You're, you're feeding families, you're supporting the revival of our culture. And I think that is way more powerful as a consumer to decide where your money goes. And it's like, do I want to enrich, you know, someone who doesn't care about human condition and are okay with brown bodies being in slavery to this day? Or do you want to give your money to someone who's supporting the revival of their culture and who are creating jobs in their community where there is no jobs, there is no... Um, you know, like security, food security, job security, anything. And so it's really about empowering the buyers and giving them an opportunity to support us. And I think that's what's the most exciting about Indigenous fashion. I mean, I was going to say what Tanya just said, but not nearly as beautifully, but um, I think that's exactly it, is that I'm so excited that Indigenous fashion is not only changing the game in terms of like how we can represent our communities and like rock really cool designs, but it's like changing the, like the fashion industry in terms of uh, the fashion industry is so exploitative and extractive and like all of these awful things with fast fashion and even high fashion that Indigenous designers working on this like person to person level um, doing things that are in relation to the land that they come from, the land that they live on, um, pushing back against these like ideals of capitalism of like fast and mass produced and like really getting people to slow down and recognize the importance of a like beautiful handcrafted piece. And I love that like Instagram has given us the ability to see behind the scenes of of artists work too. So like when you see someone hand tanning a hide and the process takes like a month on their Instagram stories and then you see the 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 earrings at the end, you realize the value of that. And then there's even like new kind of bartering networks that are popping up on among like indigenous folks on Instagram, which is like totally subverting the whole system of capitalism. So as usual, like indigenous folks have always known how to live in good relation with one another and with the earth and all of these things. And that is being carried out in these spaces. So I'm excited about the creativity and the innovation and like all of the beauty that we see and the fact that it's getting out to a lot of folks that are outside of just our communities. But I'm also really excited about the way that it's being done and the thoughtful nature that uh, a lot of the designers are taking with their, um, their work, the way that they're not contributing to these larger systems of injustice through it. So it's not just about the beauty of the designs, it's about the system that, that y'all are creating, which is amazing. Yeah, and thank you. Thank you all so much too. I, I wouldn't be in the position I am now without the community that we have built. And um, I continue to build as more Indigenous designers are coming into the forefront. It's so exciting to see the work that people are doing in the revitalization of their communities. And as we talked about, learning about uh, traditions that have been and that have been lost or were taken away and watching people really take take control of their own 
representation and identity. And I think that we have a strong place in the future of fashion, especially as we are moving in sustainability fields, like people like Tanya who work in an uh, extremely circular uh, you know, a circular um, model for the business, which is just a traditional indigenous model is this concept of circularity. Um, so I wanna go ahead and jump in and to some questions. Uh, we're gonna wrap it up at about 1.30. So we have about 20 minutes for questions. Um, and again, I wish we had more time because there's so many things that we can talk about, but I want everybody to get go home and start these conversations within your own families too. Um, one question that I am seeing a lot is that there, there, we have we touched upon it briefly, but a couple people are still asking. Um, so Jesse Wilson had asked to Jamie's point, what is the role as consumers in supporting artists and wearing or displaying their work without appropriating? And how do we determine if work is only intended for a certain community? So Jamie, how would you answer that? Yeah, like um, Adrian had mentioned, I, and I could most, I can really only speak for myself, but I mean, I have many friends, obviously, that do the same work and we all, we would not be doing what we're doing, specifically the stuff that goes out to market that's on our websites, if it was segregated. It is not, it's for everybody. Otherwise I wouldn't do it. My own community would be coming down on me if I was making stuff that isn't appropriate. We, so we have our own checks and balances. And so, um, yeah, I feel free. And I know that a lot of people are hesitant also because they don't want to be caught out on the street and someone yelling at you, what are you we're doing wearing that? Well, hey, I, you know, this is so, this is OXDX. He's a Navajo, you know, I'm supporting native owned businesses. And that's, you know, you're being supported. You're not appropriating. I love native dress. And so I am shopping for rent. Yeah, it's always so funny to me that people are so afraid of that hypothetical, like being out on the street and someone accusing you. Like, that's the thing that yeah. I get over and over again is someone's like, I'm going to be outside and someone's going to accuse me. One, I really want to know if that has ever happened to someone. Like, I really do, because I don't know if it actually has or it's just hypothetical. And two, like, why is that such a scary situation? All you do is you have an immediate rebuttal, which is, this is an amazing shirt by an artist named Jamie Akuma. She is Shoshone Bannock in Lithuania. Like you could go check her workout at jayakuma.com. It's amazing. You can rock it too. Like that's a super fast combo. You have educated the person. You have promoted your friend who's an awesome designer. Like it's great. Like I don't see why that is so scary. Like that to me is like a great conversation opener. So I don't want people to be afraid of that. <laughs> that is a silly reason to not buy from native designers to me. And then the other question is, are you scared to talk to a Native person? Because then that's a completely different conversation to have. You know, it's okay. <laughs> the only place where I think you might want to uh, be careful of is whenever you're looking at thrift stores, estate sales, and stuff like that. Because there has been so much uh, pillaging of our communities, you might actually find some extremely... Um, rare, sacred items and stuff like that. And if you do, you know, bring it somewhere. <laughs> Not, don't wear it. Don't leave it in your closet. You know, try to find the community it comes from. Try to talk to a museum, stuff like that. Like repatriate our objects back home. So if that's the question, that's where you would go. If it's on our website, please buy from us. Please support us because we really appreciate it. Yes, I, I hope that the answer to that question, and I say that often when people ask me, is I wouldn't be selling it online if it wasn't for everyone. So the other thing that I, I wanted to bring up is a question um, from Aja Barber, and it's, it's a kind of like come and get your uncle's question. So how do we deal with cherry pickers in a conversation who might find one indigenous person who gives them permission to be harmful? And quote, <laughs> well, my friend is indigenous and they disagree with that. So how, 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 do we, how do we engage in that conversation? Because this comes up a lot on social media. It's like... I want what names. What tribe are you from? That's what I want. Don't tell me it's your friend. Who is it? Where are they from? <laughs> and what can we... 
claims them who claims them i want to know who claims them yeah. because oftentimes <laughs> you can like invent yourself a tribe but i like who claims them are they actually part of that tribe and nation yeah my short answer like because that often is um especially when i am engaging in mascot conversations there's always like so and so's friend or uncle or whoever who like doesn't think mascots are bad then my response is always just like well i am another indigenous person and i do think they are bad so now you have two opinions and like <laughs> what are you going to do with those um, and there's also thousands of other people who agree with me as well. So I think, yeah, sometimes in those situations, it's just you have to kind of internally or externally roll your eyes a little bit and say like, well, you're talking to another person who has another set of opinions. And now it's up to you to decide if my my hurt or harm from this action or representation um, is not important to you. Um, and then it becomes kind of a human to human issue rather than the, my best friend is indigenous idea. Another question that we have here, um, and I'm going to, it's Kita or Kita, I'm not quite sure the pronunciation, forgive me. Um, but what can young indigenous creators do to keep from being taken advantage of? So advice from, from people here. That's a tough one. Cause it's kind of like at the end of the day, you can't, you can't stop anyone. So that's that's a hard question because I wish there were some magical steps you could take. But I think, and again, I'm not a designer, so I, I'm not an authority to speak on this, but you should expect it at one point or another, <laughs> sad to say. But I do think you need to build a strong community around you who can help you should that happen. You know, if you're friends with other designers, with journalists like myself, and this happens, you can go to your network and you can best be sure we'll be knocking on that door in five minutes. You know what I mean? Like, I think it's important to just have a good community, have a core group around you, and, and we can help um, because this always happens. It's gonna continue happening. For me, like, oh my God, that, that's part of, part of life. You don't have always the best people around you, but how else are you going to learn? I've learned my best lessons the hardest ways, but I'm never doing them again or working with whoever again. It's not going to happen. So you do need to go through that and don't beat yourself down for letting it happen to you. Just learn from it. And it's also like, it's like community over competition. Don't see another Indigenous designer as your competition there is room for us all in this market. The market is global, it's huge, and we have so many different stories, we have so many different backgrounds. Like even if we're in the same tribe, the same family, we still have different stories. We'll still have a different take on our nation and stuff like that. So it's important to build your community online the same way you have your community at home, like reach out to those other designers, talk about it. And if you're inspired by someone else, just say it. It's fine to be like, Jamie inspired me to create this because I dream of her design every day and I might not be able to afford it right now because I have to pay my rent and eat, but I really want to be able to emulate or, you know, you know, and, and that's important. Those conversations are important and creating community and instead of feeling that you're by yourself because we'll show up for you. I often like comment on someone, like message someone and be like, hey, are you okay with this? Like I've seen this happen. And it's like, there's your aunties out there on social media and they will come if you need help. Yeah, I just encourage young people to like, know their own power in terms of that you don't have to say yes to every opportunity. Um, if there is any sort of um, red flag with anything, like knowing that it's okay to say no, even if it seems like a really cool thing with a big brand or something, that those big collaborations are often where the getting taken advantage of really happens. And so knowing that if you follow what Tanya was just laying out in terms of building your community slowly and um, with 
of emphasis on building relationships and things like that, the opportunities will come, the good ones. Um, and I think I, um, another phrase that I'm still working out the implications, but I always operate on this model of like consenting to learn in public. So basically like letting people see when I have changed my thinking or when I've recognized that something I did was harmful or that I'm growing and learning. And so that's something that I hope young folks who are entering into this, this field and, um, and wanting to do this can learn too. So if you do make a mistake and you mess up, that you have practiced just apologizing and moving forward or reframing and moving forward, and that it doesn't have to be the like big dramatic ending of everything, that it can be a process of growth and learning and that we all can appreciate that and learn along with you from that. I think, I think that's a really important conversation to have is that within transparency, I do a lot of public learning. And I think that's always good to, be, to hold yourself accountable as well. Another thing that came up, and we, we've kind of touched on this before, but as we talk about communities coming together to support like younger Indigenous designers, how can allies also support and fight cultural appropriation? Kaylee Cherry is asking, as a teen, what are ways younger generations can res constructively, respectfully, and impactfully hold fashion industry accountable for cultural appropriation as someone who is not Native? And I want to just give my opinion really quickly is that um, it's not just our fight, you know, and, and that's why these conversations need to continue happening. A, a lot of times in social media, people will send me things that are uh, appropriation. And my first thought is, why aren't you calling it out? Why are you sending it to me? I already know this is happening. So it's kind of, I, I always urge people to educate their own communities through their own voice because this is something that we have to deal with on a daily basis and that emotional labor is not always something that we are prepared to take on in a day. So I, I would answer Kaylee that you absolutely hold the power. If you see somebody do, being appropriative that you can call them out and you can do it respectfully and say, I don't know if this is appropriate or you can ask questions and get a conversation started. Do, what, how do you guys feel about that? What you just said, Karina, about there's a manner of way of addressing these things. And right now it's like rage everywhere. No one's going to, I don't learn that way. If you're going to scream at me, I'm not listening to you. So you have to, yeah, a more inquisitive question. Is that right? Kind of looks like this. I don't, maybe I don't know. Um, and be receptive to learning and teaching someone through more of kindness and misunderstanding not as attacking because i'm telling you no one's going to listen to that i don't at all ever so and i know a lot of people and that's probably where that question comes from not being of the same um being a non-native um you would feel that way because you would have natives and i've seen it go well who are you to talk about that you know what do you know about it so i i get it um, and I think the best way is just kindness, kind questions, kind answers, willing to educate in a very in a very civil way. Yeah, I have a very quick story time that speaks to this. I'll keep it short. But <laughs> I think it was a few weeks ago, someone had sent me this dream catcher sweater. Um, it, it was a sweater with a dream catcher sewn into it. Uh, we can get into why that's not a good thing, but I'm not going to go there. But obviously... A form of cultural appropriation. It was a Japanese brand. And so I didn't spot this first, but someone sent it to me. It was a store in Vancouver selling it. And I, you know, messaged them, like you said, kind, kindly, respectfully, having an open intro as to why they shouldn't sell this. But they would not have taken it down if it weren't for um, friends, both Indigenous, non-Indigenous, also messaging them. Like, it, it is power in numbers and it, it's in the way you approach the thing too. Like my, you know, everyone wasn't messaged and be like, you're, I mean, I'm sure people were like, you're an idiot, whatever. But most people were just being like, Hey, this is really harmful. I urge you to please. Oh, I love this dog. Um, you know, I urge you to please reconsider selling this. Like, you know, this is why. And I think approaching it that way, is very powerful, even for allies to do too, because it worked, they took down the sweater. So, you know, not just indigenous people, everyone can 
make a difference. Yes. Okay. So we're approaching the last five minutes. Um, so I, I would like to say thank you all so, 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 so much for joining me here today. Um, we could keep going all day, but I know other people have things to do and we all got a lot of work to do because a lot of us work alone. I want to also quickly just go through and have you each say um, the best ways to find you uh, and to learn about you so that these conversations can continue and that we can uh, learn about each other. So Christian, do you want to give us your Instagram handle and how, we, how else we can find you? Sure. My Insta uh, Instagram is Chris J. Allaire. Um, and you can find me on Vogue.com. Just search my name. I write about Indigenous fashion always. And that's where you can find me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I am at Corina Emmerich. And you can find my website at emmerichny.com. Um, and we will be sending out a, a short resource list with everybody's um, Instagram handles and websites as well. So don't worry too much about the spelling. Um, Jamie? Yeah, uh, Instagram is j.okuma, J-O-K-U-M-A, uh, Facebook, it's my full name. And yeah, my website is jokuma.com and you have all the info there as well. Um, Tanya. Um, you can find me on Instagram at tanya.larson and on my website, tanyalarson.com. Adrian. Um, I am at Native Approps um, on Instagram and nativeappropriations.com and allmyrelationspodcast.com. And if you are nerdy and academic and want to read about natives in higher education, my actual real life job is researching that. And it's on uh, adriankeen.com. So thank you, everybody, so much for attending this class. Uh, we really appreciate it. And we'll keep this conversation going. And uh, see you on Instagram. And thank you so much. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.